So you're seeing mold problems all around your house. Maybe this is even your second or third time experiencing these issues in a short time frame. You've ruled out leaks, you've thoroughly scrubbed and cleaned the materials, and you've removed moldy drywall, but you're still not sure what's going on. Well, have you insulated recently? Or is your building generally well insulated? Believe it or not, insulation plays a huge role in determining the success or failure of a building, as well as the location of the insulation and the type of insulation that's used. In this video, we're talking all about how insulation can actually be the cause of your mold problems, what's needed for mold to grow, and what you can do to prevent it from happening in the future. Let's get into it. So let's quickly talk about mold and how it forms, just so we have some context. What most people don't understand is that mold is always around us in the form of microscopic spores. It's one of the most abundant organisms on the planet, and there's no way to truly eradicate it. However, what we can do is prevent the mold spores from activating and generating more spores and deteriorating our buildings and potentially posing a risk to our health. You need three things for mold to grow. You need water or moisture. You need a food source. And you need the right temperature range. If you eliminate one of these variables, mold won't grow. Now, we don't want to operate our buildings at extremely high or extremely low temperatures, which can be detrimental to us as well. We also don't want our buildings to get wet, and if they do get wet, we want them to dry out. But really, the easiest way to prevent mold growth is to address the moisture problems, and then if we need to go a step further, we can remove food sources and make it that much harder for mold to grow. When we see mold growth in the building, there's a moisture problem on some level, that moisture can be in the form of a leak, or it can be high relative humidity that results in condensation. Now, when we have a building that's uninsulated or poorly insulated, we have a ton of heat flow moving in and out of the building, both via conduction through the components and through convection or through air movement. Because the buildings were leaky and poorly insulated or downright uninsulated, heat would constantly inundate the building, drying out the components if they ever got wet. It also kept the building components a lot warmer because the structure was in close contact with the interior conditions. There was nothing restricting heat from reaching the backside of the sheathing or the backside of the interior finishes. However, when we insulate inside the cavity space formed by our studs or rafters or floor joists, we fundamentally change how that building performs both thermally and from a moisture management perspective. While we reduce the amount of energy loss through the building by insulating, we have also done two other things. We have thermally isolated the backside of the sheathing or the structure from the heat loss of the building. It's thermally uncoupled, so the backside of the sheathing stays closer to outdoor conditions and the interior finishes stay closer to interior conditions. The second thing that happens is that we have reduced the drying potential because insulation slows heat flow. That's kind of the point. So what does this mean for mold? Well, if we're in a cool climate, we can see condensation form on the back side of our sheathing because that sheathing is no longer coupled to the interior temperatures. If you're in a hot climate and if you're air conditioning the interior space, we can see condensation form on the back side of the drywall. And where there's condensation, there's mold. We've covered this topic in several other videos about condensation, relative humidity, and warming our condensing surfaces, which we'll put links to up here and in the description below. But before condensation even forms, we can actually start to see mold growth when the interior relative humidity begins to exceed 60%. This is because materials like wood and paper are hygroscopic. They can absorb and adsorb moisture from the air. As relative humidity increases in the home and in the cavity space, the moisture content of these components increases. What moisture content does mold start to grow on framing components? Sometimes as low as 22% on engineered materials like OSB and fiberboard, and 25% or more on real wood if it's wet for a prolonged amount of time, we're not talking about cycles of wetting and drying, we're talking about an average. So, if we are seeing mold problems on the interior side, like on our drywall or backside of the interior finishes, most likely we have moisture that's diffusing or leaking into the building from the exterior to the interior, where it finds a cool surface to condense on. This is most common when we are dealing with warm, humid climates or climates that have warm, humid summers. This basically describes the entire eastern United States and down through Texas. We need to do two things in this case. We need to stop warm, humid outside air from leaking in through our building enclosure, and we need to stop that air at its source from the exterior side so it doesn't enter the cavity. 
Then we need to make sure that we have dehumidification. This goes for warm climates and cold climates, but especially warm climates and mixed climates. We need a means of moisture removal so that we don't have high interior relative humidities in combination with air conditioning. If we air condition our interior space, many surfaces are going to be much lower than the dew point temperature. Now, there are a few other things that can exacerbate this. For one, if you have a reservoir cladding like brick or stucco, these are materials that absorb and store water, and we can get very strong vapor drive to the interior because we have what is essentially a wet sponge on the outside of our building. If you're designing a new building and you have these types of claddings, you need to make sure that you have some sort of exterior vapor retarder to slow down inwardly driven moisture. This can be either a WRB that is 10 perms or less. You could use rigid foam as a vapor retarder, or you can use some sort of uncoupling membrane, but the point is we want to slow down inwardly driven vapor if we have a reservoir cladding and if we are in a warm, humid climate or mixed climate. If you're working with an existing structure where the brick or the stucco is just constantly absorbing moisture, you can apply a water repellent paint or coating to reduce the amount of surface absorption, which will reduce the amount of vapor that is driven inwards. For cold climates, if you are experiencing mold problems in the wall, we need to make sure that our cavities are staying warmer and closer to interior conditions rather than exterior conditions. We also need to control our interior relative humidity, just like in the warmer climates. We don't want warm, moisture-laden air from the interior side that's generated by bathing, cooking, and breathing to come into contact with the backside of the sheathing unless that sheathing is warm. Vapor isn't much of a problem until it becomes liquid water. So we want a dehumidifier in our cold climates as a mechanical means of moisture removal. Then we want to make sure that we are either preventing that warm air from coming into contact with the cold sheathing, either through the use of an interior air barrier or by warming the condensing surface of the sheathing with exterior rigid insulation. We've also covered this in previous videos, but the amount of exterior rigid insulation that you need for condensation control is completely dependent on the climate zone that you're building in, the relative humidity and temperature that you're operating under, and the amount of insulation in the cavity space, not to mention that some moisture sensitive components like engineered woods probably need more exterior insulation to ensure that the moisture content of these components is kept within safe levels. So that's how we're dealing with moisture in the form of vapor that's transferred via air leakage and diffusion. There's another factor that we discussed, and that's eliminating the food source. Mold feeds on organic material. It prefers to feed on organic material that's easy to digest, like paper, where it can extract the sugars or carbohydrates very easily. Real wood is harder to break down than engineered wood, so it's harder for mold to consume it. In very specific cases, we will swap out standard drywall for a fiberglass matte faced gypsum. This replaces the paper facer, which is what the mold feeds on, with an inorganic fiberglass matte facer, which is highly moisture resistant and won't support mold growth. You don't need to do this on your entire house or building, but there are cases when we're expecting a lot of inward vapor drive or potential exposure to high humidity environments, and that's where we tend to use the fiberglass matte faced gypsum. This is all a very fine balance. It's very easy to prevent mold from growing when we design for these things and when we know what to look out for. If we control moisture both in liquid form and vapor form from challenging our building materials while providing a means of drying and keeping our building materials at consistent temperatures and safe relative humidity ranges, we eliminate our mold problems. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at assiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.